Hello and welcome to episode 31 of Off the Bandstand. My name is Christian Wiggs. I am your host. Today's episode is Paolo Santos, an incredible saxophonist and familiar face on the Austin jazz scene. Paolo is currently finishing up his undergraduate degree at the University of Texas at Austin, and then also is frequently writing compositions both inside and outside the university setting for big band and combo. In this episode, we talk about the various sites that he's seen uh, as a gigging musician, whether it's you know street preachers at farmers markets to space underwear themed co-op parties with the brass bands that he would play with. Uh, we also talk about how taking a backseat to his own thoughts allowed him to notice the imminent opportunities that were in front of him. And then a recording session from hell that taught a vital lesson on not only communication, but preparation as well. So moving into the releases of the week, uh, of course, Stephen Feifke has a new single out that is Nika's Dream, the Horus Silver tune. Uh, he had arranged this for, I believe, a septet on his record Peace in Time in 2015, but decided to bring it back for his uh, Stephen Feifke big band record that is coming out in April. So, I mean, what can you say about Stephen? Every single thing that he puts out is gonna be the top-notch quality. This is especially groovy. You have to go check it out. It's eight minutes of full big band goodness and I've been listening to it on repeat ever since it came out. So go and check that out. If you want to support Steven directly, you can go to stephen5keymusic.com and you can find not only sheet music of his compositions there and his arrangements, but direct links to buying physical copies of CDs or digital copies, what have you. It's always great to go straight to the source and support musicians directly. So the next one that I want to plug is one that is new to me, but has been out for, I guess, two decades now. Uh, this is from Bob Meyer's Concept Orchestra. The record is called Artscape and it released in 2001. I've been doing some kind of uh, archival duties with uh, some projects with the Elephant Room, the kind of preeminent jazz venue here in town, uh, COVID excluding. And, uh, you know, one of the names that just keeps popping up as one of the pillars of the Austin jazz scene was Bob Meyer. And he was apparently an absolutely phenomenal trumpet player and a arranger and composer, uh, but also really great pianist as well. I've heard some amazing stories. And as I listen to this record, it just shows the, uh, you know, embarrassment of riches as a callback to Adrian Ruiz's episode, the embarrassment of riches that we have of the musicians that here, are here on the Austin scene now and have been for the past several decades, not only in the early 2000s, but going back to the 70s. Really, we have such a, a special thing in the environment that is the Austin jazz scene. So make sure to go and support that. Uh, I believe you can find some digital downloads over on Amazon Music, but also you can go to Spotify and stream it as well. So go and check out these big band arrangements. They are fantastic. And then now, moving on to the Monk shows, of course, every week we have the Monk shows to promote that Colin Shook uh, has going on. Colin was just featured in the Austin Chronicle this morning uh, for, you know, all the work that he's been doing, really kind of single-handedly keeping the jazz scene alive and afloat in a time where everything has been shut down kind of across the board. These live streams have been such an incredible blessing to everybody, not only listening to them, but being able to participate in them as well. So the uh, Monk shows that we have this week, uh, tonight, Greg, Greg Clifford Quartet is February 4th, Thursday. That's at 7.30. Uh, Greg and I, I plugged this last week, but Greg and I uh, were playing together a lot whenever I had just gotten into town and he was just a knockout, an amazing drummer. And I know that he's going to bring uh, a really eclectic, very, very um, exciting product to the Monk stage. Uh, then the next one that we have coming up is the next installment of Austin Jazz Society's Project Safety Net Concerts. This is the Pamela Hart Quintet. Uh, Pamela Hart kind of has the moniker of Miss Jazz here in Austin. She's been here for uh, you know decades and has certainly been one of those people that has been a pillar keeping up the scene. So go and check that out. She's going to be with her quintet. And then next Thursday, funny enough that we referenced Adrian Ruiz just a few minutes ago, because on Thursday, February 11th, Adrian is going to be back with his quintet, putting on some of his uh, original compositions and arrangements as well. So tune into those and check out those records. Really amazing stuff across the board. So much to get excited about. And for now, let's dive into episode 31, Paolo Santos, 
This is Off the Bandstand. Finishing my last semester, finishing up classes, uh, playing whenever I can. I just got in touch with Colin about trying to do another Monks show. So cool, um, man. hopefully that'll go through. Yeah, just just living it up though. Yeah, man, so is that for Eternal? Well, Eternal was like basically something we came up with because James and Aaron Parks didn't have social media. Okay. And they were like, we need someone to lead this band who has social media so they can like advertise it. And they were like, Paolo, you do it. <laughs> okay. So were you already a part of the band before? Yeah. So we started that by sort of playing, playing around like the, the like downtown farmer's market that happens on Sunday or on Saturdays. Um, there were a few weeks uh, where we got to, where we got to do that. And at first it was just the trio of them three it was uh, Tommy Howard and Aaron Parks and James. Um, and then James just, you know, I was hanging out with him one day, we were just playing some tunes and he was like, Hey, I got this farmer's market gig tomorrow. You want to come and play? We're playing like all these fun, like deep cut hard bop tunes. And I was like, well, fucking sure, dude. Like that sounds like a good time. And then they're like, let's keep on playing. Let's keep on rehearsing and learning stuff. So that's sort of where that, where that took off from. I mean, you know, regrettably, I haven't really, we haven't really gotten a chance to, to play much more recently. Uh, you know, I think a lot of that is just due to the fact that it actually got kind of cold in Austin for once and right. we we're doing a lot of the rehearsing outside. Yeah. So once the weather starts warming up, which it already seems like it is, I'm hoping we can uh, get back to, to just playing, like even just for fun, you know? Yeah, for sure. That, that seems like, um, not at all that I'm like, oh, that doesn't work. But it doesn't seem intuitive to me that it's like farmer's market, hard bop, like deep cut tunes. That doesn't seem like the obvious choice. It's usually like some dude singing wagon wheel um, that maybe shouldn't be singing wagon wheel. <laughs> like that's that's what I think of when I think farmer's market. So that's amazing that that was like, and, and tolerated sounds like a like bad word to use, but like by the general public where they're not just kind of like, all right, what's going on? What, what is this music? Because hard bop is definitely a, a niche, right? Yeah. So. No, they really, they really dug it, which was really cool. Um, they, I mean, there were, you know, there were a lot of those like, you know, curbside like evangelists or whatever, trying, trying to like, you know, spread the spread the word of the good Lord very loudly um, <laughs> on a street corner downtown. So one of those days they were like, hey, can you guys like play louder, please? Oh, whoa. <laughs> Even they were like, please drown these people out, like get them to move away. Wow. Okay. So like at that, at that point, you were just playing like a bunch of Ornette Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, definitely, dude. We were going hard in on the monks, on the monk right. tunes too, and stuff like that, you know, just having a good time with it. <laughs> it's hilarious too, because like I wonder if you know, maybe you guys didn't hear it because you were playing louder, but maybe they were starting to be like, see, the devil is present here in this, in the form of this quartet. Like, oh this is God. the devil's music, you know? And whenever you said that, uh, they were like, oh, well, let's get somebody to lead it who has social media. At first, I thought you were saying that it was, you weren't in the band before, and they were just like, all right, let's go down a list of who has social yeah. media. And then we'll invite them to be a part of the band. I thought that was like the vibe of where it was going for a second, but no. That would have been really interesting. Yeah. So tell me about like, who's picking the repertoire of that group? Is it like very much a collective effort or just like throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks? Yeah. So at first it was just, it was like mostly the three of them. They had, they had a set list that they had already been playing uh, at the farmer's market the couple weeks that I wasn't there. Sure. Um, it was, you know, mostly like D 
different like Wayne Shorter and her and uh you know Herbie Tunes, Monk Tunes, uh Joe Henderson, stuff like that. Um yeah. and then once, you know, once they invited me along, we we all sort of threw together our ideas of, you know, I mean, we sort of had the idea of working towards a a monk show just because those were starting to get really popular and Colin was was you know ramping up production of all those and everything um so then we sort of decided to set our eyes on like all right what what tunes can we play as like an actual set and and start refining those ones so after that it was like definitely more of a group effort for sure so was this in any association i apologize if you've already said this was this in any association with the like uh front lawn concerts that your family's been doing it wasn't but we did play one okay. um and actually and actually i guess we can we can promote this well not really since we don't have an actual date but we will be starting those up again once the weather gets better um cool. yeah my mom my mom has been a you know a really excited to all right she was really excited to get those going you know mm-hmm. giving people a place to uh to perform whenever you know for a live audience too i mean you know the monks the monks things are incredible because the youtube audience and the facebook audience are so mm. engaged and, and interactive and everything but i mean you know nothing beats a live audience yeah when did they stop Were they just stop for like winter whenever it got really cold yeah we stopped uh probably sometime in october or november just when it started getting really cold and then also whenever it started to get uh get dark a lot earlier too you know we would we would be doing a concert at like six or whatever and it would it would be like pitch black by the end of it definitely um but they were they were super fun I mean you know the neighbors at first you know the way that those even started was just I was hanging out with my parents on our lawn and one of the neighbors came over and she was like you know hey you should you know grab your saxophone and play something I didn't have my horn at that place oh so so it like took took a little bit of convincing, but I you know I drove back to my place, which wasn't very far anyways. Yeah. Drove back to my place, grabbed my horn, and then just like came back, played a couple <laughs> tunes, you know, just solo, just for the like four people that were there. And yeah. then my mom was like, "Hey, you want to have like Thomas come and do something with yeah. uh, with you next time?" And I was like, "Sure, that sounds like fun." So then like a week <laughs> later, Thomas came, played some, then uh. Then it was me and Thomas and Chris Loveland did a little trio. And then, then after that, we started just inviting, you know, anyone who, who we thought would have a good time and was in, you know, we, you know, we left, left the stage open basically. Yeah. Yeah. Once they start back up, you should definitely, I think I'll uh, definitely going to put my name, put your name out to my mom. Cause I think it would be super great. And I think people would really enjoy it too. You know, the neighbors are, they really love them. They get to hang out outside on their porches and everything and just listen to music. For sure. Isn't it weird how things have changed where like in, I mean, I've, I've never been to your place, but based on the, the live streams, it looks like it's just like a nice quiet neighborhood. Right. And I feel like a lot of people like that idea of like, even if they're in the city, having that like suburban life, you know, where it's like quiet, you don't have to worry about a bunch of stuff going on um but then how after the monotony of like every day just having the same routine of just staying inside people are like begging for some sort of excitement you know uh which not to say that anybody would be particularly bothered by like the music that you guys would be playing if it was like outside of COVID time like normal stuff but the idea that people are like oh we have something to look forward to because there's such a lack of things to look forward to you know what I mean Oh, totally, dude. Um, I also, you know, it's funny that you sort of mentioned like people, uh, you know, thinking of it as like a, as like quiet neighborhood too. Cause I mean, you know, when I was, when I was growing up there, there were like no kids on the block at all, basically other than like me and my sister and a few other people. And now like people have lots of kids on that block and lot, you know, like they have school bubbles and pods and stuff going on there. So the thought originally was like, oh, well, evening, or at least my thoughts originally were like, oh, we're having like these evening concerts, you know, I mean, it's already probably difficult enough to get your kids down on like a school night when it's COVID and you've been like, you know, staying inside and not doing anything for months already. Like, I wonder how, how they're going to 
hang hang with the music you know but all the neighbors are like super into it which is really great they even had a there was one week where there was like a some some walking tour of like the the neighborhood area and they put our, you know the the lawn concert on it as well so like oh, whoa. there there's a bunch of people coming down on on one day i can't remember who was playing that day but a lot of people like walked by and you know people just stick around once they once they see it and hear it even just evening neighborhood walks or whatever it's a fun thing to discover yeah right absolutely um and i i almost thought too one of the things of uh you know somebody being like oh just like get your horn out and like your saxophone and start playing and i and, you know i want to ask about that too of of because i've been at several family gatherings where like we're home for christmas or whatever and you know like my grandmother or step grandmother is like oh no okay now get up get up in front of everybody and start singing because that's what you do <laughs> and i think that this is gonna like for musicians like hearing this i i hope that it resonates like on a very personal level that i know that that's the thing that i hate more than anything else in the world but not because they're like being inconsiderate like to them it's just like oh you love to share music you play gigs oh you should just like sing you know some standards in front of the whole family like put on a concert like I get that they have the best intentions in mind but to a certain extent because it's our craft and it's our our job it feels a little bit like dance monkey dance you know it's like dance for me enter, enter, like a court jester like dance for me entertain me you know um so was there any hesitancy about that or like awkwardness or or do you feel like the the vibe of the neighbors was like no this is just like a communal thing um as opposed to this kind of like oh well, well Paolo's an entertainer like well he should just do this I mean the neighbor who was there it was like a hundred percent just like a oh Paolo's here and he knows how to play the saxophone he should just play sure she, you know she just wanted to hear it and she's a she's a woman who just she speaks her mind and I I fucking love her for that um yeah. and you know it took some convincing definitely I wasn't necessarily in the mood to just bust out a horn and start playing <laughs> solo saxophone but she got me there and <laughs> <laughs> she's a good salesman yeah oh clearly yeah um no it was it after that it was like a super fun time and I was really into it just because that was still at the point where like really no one was playing at all you know I think I think every single gig I had for the rest of the year had been like canceled at that point basically right. And it was before anything started coming back. So I was like, whoa, I have this opportunity to play for other people and get other people in and also, you know, play with other people. Yeah, I think I think the gig that I did with Thomas there was the first time I had played with another person in a while, at least. Yeah. Like it was it was super nice and super refreshing. Yeah. I remember talking to uh, Fabio about something in like <clears throat> June, July, maybe. Um Cause like I did a stretch of like March, like everybody else to September where I hadn't played a gig. And I remember talking to Fabio in like June and he was like, yeah, I just played this like outdoor trio gig. And this might seem dramatic, but I was like, whoa, man, how, how was it? You know? Cause it's like, oh, this was so normal, but then now it's been so long. And he was like, it was somehow the same and completely weird at the same time. Like, like it felt, it was like, it just felt, it felt off, but it felt familiar and safe at the same time, which was like this weird dichotomy of, of, of feelings. Um, but yeah, man, I, then I remember us like the first gig I did back was actually with you. It was at that, oh, that, yeah. that outdoor wedding thing where we were, we were in that backyard and, and man, that was just, it was like so nice just to, to see people in a, in a safe way, you know, as safe as we can make it at least, but totally dude, it was, it was a, it was a blast to get those going and I'm definitely looking forward to to having more of them in the future for sure. I mean, you know, my mom was the one who was doing most of the legwork, but you know, it was it was totally a community thing as well. I mean, we didn't really get a lot of we, I mean, we didn't really pay anybody out of pocket. It was all just through tips and everything and, you know, some nights I think we had a we had Michael Hale organ trio come by one time. Oh, cool. People love that group so much. I mean, they're so great. You know, they blow up the Continental Club all the time. Um, 
and they did they did super well i mean i i don't remember how much but they were all walking in walking away with like some great money for only playing for like an hour ish you know so so it was some pretty serious whataburger money after the gig oh, right? yeah definitely <laughs> <laughs> gotta go get those hub chubs dude <laughs> man uh, man well I, I really want to like get to know more about like your uh, uh, trajectory like uh, over the course of your life of a musician because you and I have known each other for several years now and yet it feels so weird that sometimes we feel like we really know people but then we're like oh I, I haven't asked about this about their childhood or whatever and maybe it's just because like whatever hang or conversation didn't really like facilitate going to that area. But then, you know, when we were preparing for this and I was talking to you and, and texting you, I was like, man, I really want to get to know more about Palo because you're a super cool and swell guy and an amazing player. And I want to know like where all of that started to piece together for you. I know that you have a musical family, but like what were, what were the earliest memories of starting music in your household? Hmm. Okay. Um, well, I guess my, well, the earliest memories I have of music stuff, or at least I don't even know if this really counts as a memory. It's just what I've been told by my parents, but they would have rehearsals for their bands in, in our house. And I remember my dad and my mom always telling me that I used to like sit right next to the bass player or something like that. And just like, just kind of look at like, like sit there and just, just hang out basically. Yeah. So it almost makes me wonder why I didn't play the bass, but right. I also really admire the bass and it's one of those instruments I've always wanted to play. So that's probably something. Um, first musical stuff though was for a very, very brief time. I like took some drum set lessons, not enough to remember at all, but then from there I started taking piano lessons. I did you know, like Suzuki piano with a, with a, a neighbor who was a piano teacher. Um, those were great, but I hated practicing. And I subsequently uh, was not good at piano because of that. <laughs> so that stopped. But then once I got into, uh, into middle school, I started doing, doing, you know, middle school band through that whole thing. Um, a great saxophone player in town, Scotty McIntosh, who's a, a friend of my parents, uh, plays a lot with them. He had offered me, offered to like, just lend me a flute basically, like mm. maybe a year before I got to, got to school, uh, got to middle school. And I sort of started messing around with it a little bit. My dad sort of knew how to play a little bit as well. So we were sort of messing around with it together. But once I got into middle school, something just like something clicked with me and I just like really wanted to to go for it so I started started practicing it and trying to trying to get good I mean it definitely helped that my sister you know she's an incredible violin player she uh she started when she was like seven I think and you know I would go to her violin lessons at her teacher's house with my mom and just sit outside so I you know I always knew what good music was supposed like good classical music was supposed to sound like so it was I don't know I always had that image in my head so I feel like that that definitely helped um so flute flute was the the first one yeah flute was my first instrument uh it's not really one that I play all that much anymore which yeah sometimes surprises me but it's one of I feel like for me it's one of those things that since I just have such a such a long history with it by now I can yeah, I can pick it. I always like pick it up randomly when I'm sitting on the couch and just noodle around and stuff like that. And then every once in a while, I'll, you know, pick out an etude book or whatever and try and read some stuff. Um, yeah, so I did flute and I also sung in choir for a bit in middle school. Um, oh, cool. But once I got to high school, the same the same guy, Scotty, he, uh, he offered to start teaching me saxophone lessons because I sort of started started wanting to explore, you know, outside of the realm of just classical music and wind yeah. band stuff. Um, so I started playing alto, it was pretty bad for a while, you know. <laughs> um, I like the, I, uh, I like the, the, uh, the transparency. Yeah. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, like, 
starting out on an instrument like that is really hard like starting a brand new instrument especially when you already know how to play something else like you know even just decently well like you know I won't say I was you know fantastic at flute but I wasn't bad definitely um especially going to reeds I mean that's like a whole other freaking universe oh it took me forever to figure out like how to find out what read I actually like using and even yeah. still really um yeah. Yeah, so I started doing that going into high school. I was in the the jazz band at my high school all four years. And uh first two years were I was still, you know, definitely, definitely learning stuff. But I got I was fortunate enough to to make it into one of the all region jazz bands when I was a sophomore and playing with just a bunch of people that were like way way better than me and you know I mean even it was just you know looking back it was you know high school level so I mean I'm sure I'm sure the the level of of insane talent was a little bit yeah you know, not to not to talk bad about those people but I'm you know we were all high schoolers um, sure. so maybe maybe it was a little exaggerated in the memory but but still oh my god I mean something something from that just like clicked and it just made me really really want to go for it like really hard um yeah. and just start start really trying to to learn the the craft and everything and and sure. try and you know get to that level on an instrument that was totally new to me and be able to to play the music that I really got into you know my first my first interest in in jazz mainly was like I started listening to like Count Basie orchestra recordings and stuff like that. That was like, I had two albums on my phone for a while and I would just right. listen to them like back and forth right. basically to the point where I had, you know, solos and stuff memorized and yeah. whatever. Um, and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to play like that for a while. So yeah. that along with, you know, just being in a situation where I was super uncomfortable and surrounded by, by people who were just, you know, absolute killers on their instrument. Mm -hmm. It it was super eye opening, and it definitely gave me a gave me like the you know the mental push that I needed to to really start thinking about this as like a you know a thing that I really enjoyed and like you know even a possible lifestyle. I mean, you know, my my parents were musicians, but whenever I was born, you know, they had already had they had other jobs as well so it was never a it was never a full-time thing for them so you know they always played gigs you know a few times a month and everything with their bands and they were super great um you know I remember going to see them at this restaurant Sao Paulo that was on a uh, San Jacinto near near UT and they had a a gig there a couple times a month I think and they would just, you know, I could always tell that they were just having such a blast whenever they were doing it. And I really wanted to, to learn how to, how to be a part of that. Cause that was, cause that music, it was different than the classical music that I had been hearing my sister play. They were playing Brazilian music and stuff like that. Latin music, they, you know, it had, it had the improvisational elements that, you know, the classical music my sister was playing just didn't have. Right. And you know, something about that totally just like clicked in my head. I was like, oh, I want to like start doing that stuff. Right. Well, th that was something that I was really curious about is, is, you know, I feel like, at least in my experience, the people who go into jazz in like high school and they get into jazz band, right? It, it doesn't seem, I noticed that there weren't as many people who went from like a non-jazz yeah, instrument and not to say jazz flute isn't isn't a part of the jazz idiom oh no i totally get what you're not saying the, the obvious choice right um not very many people went like flute to saxophone uh to get in there it was usually like saxophone and then other you know uh woodwind players would pick up flute as well you know to accommodate whatever sammy nestico you know extra right. flute part w was in there rest in peace sammy nestico yeah uh, but and then also just like the idea of people kind of, I don't want to say willingly getting into jazz because that implies that it's like somebody's forcing them to, but where did like the jazz idiom start to come into place where it was really interesting for you, especially when 
like your sister, right, is doing something that is very clearly like one one style. Was it just wanting to mix it up, or was there something about it that just like grabbed you and was like, I I immediately have to go towards this sound? Well, my parents also, you know, always listened to all types of music. They, you know, the records that they had on whenever I was growing up, it was, you know, anywhere from like Brazilian funk, like Javon to, uh, you know, like Stevie Wonder and Earth, Wind and Fire and, you know, Jackson 5, stuff like that. So I had a lot of introduction already to like the the popular music sort of side, I suppose. Um, yeah. So I'm sure some of just even having having that in my head, you know, especially listening to like, you know, guys like Stevie and Earth, Wind and Fire, they have so so much of their music is like drenched in that like jazz jazz harmony and language too, just right. with a with a different beat behind it, basically. Um, okay. So I think it was part of that, but then also, you know, that, there was just something that just like really pulled me in. I can't really say what it was to be honest uh you know probably the probably the part that was most memorable was you know last couple years of middle school just constantly listening to to these same like two bassy compilation albums yeah. that I had basically and that was something about that I was just like oh my god this band is so cool like they're so tight they're their soloists were all insane. It had, you know, it was a compilation album too. So it was only the best tracks. Yeah. Right. So everything was, was, you know, like a complete banger. And I just really wanted to do that too. Like I, you know, I probably, I probably wanted to play those charts specifically for almost my entire like high school, like school yeah. public school career like those things were like exactly what I wanted to do for a while and basically until I until I was able to finally kind of get to that point I was just I felt like I was just like reaching and reaching mm -hmm. and I feel like that that sort of reaching just kept on pulling me in um you know it definitely also helped that some of my some of my good friends in in school were also getting really into it um one of my great friends was a trombone player and they were super, super into that stuff. Trombone Shorty as well. They introduced right. me to, to him and, you know, that's a whole, whole other genre sure. of, of mixing and sure. stuff. Uh, yeah. And then also I remember in high school, I did a, uh, it was like a one-time thing that Andre Hayward did, but he did like a little week long, like, summer program that was like seven people or something like that it was not yeah. many people but I remember I I did that that week and like you know Andre Hayward most amazing cat ever yeah. um you know he did what he always does and just blows people's minds and you know gives the best like advice and everything yeah. and I think I think also you know getting to study and work with him at at the age where I was still quite a developing musician mm. really had had an effect on me I think just because like I had this this trombone god basically yeah. just you know coming in we're playing choruses on oleo or whatever and you know we all sound kind of mediocre and then he just takes like this blissful solo or whatever yeah. and you're just like I want to do that always right you're like, man, this guy should be in the Lincoln Center band. He just sounds amazing. <laughs> sounds yeah, amazing. Right. Man, so what what influences now like the music that you really want to create? Like what I, I'm curious to to understand the the progression now, right? So like it started with with the Basie band and and hearing those records and listening to those over and over again. But where is it now? Like what are the things that you're listening to that influence the way that you play? Is it strictly stuff that is more bebop? Or are you venturing out like someone who I think is someone who listens to the most eclectic amount of music uh, is Thomas, right? Like yeah. Thomas is always listening to things and always like we'll be on gigs and he'll be like, Hey man, do you know this, um, 
oh, I can't remember the band that he always talks about. Um, it starts with an S and they're from like the 70s and the Stylistics. 80s. Stylistics. Stylistics, thank you. Um, he's always like, hey man, do you know the Stylistics tune? Or we'd be like driving to a gig and he'd be like, oh man, we should start incorporating these. And they were never the obvious choice, right, for me. Uh, and then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to be open-minded. And then boom, like an entire another world of, of, of sounds and grooves opened up. What is influencing the way and the trajectory of where you want to go with your music? I mean, I'm not going to lie. You know, Thomas did uh, introduce me to a lot of the music that I listen to now, probably. Uh, you know, I met him whenever I was a senior in high school for the first time, just sort of on a, basically just kind of, kind of randomly, uh, I was playing with this, with this brass band that we both used to play with called Big Wise Brass Band. Um, and we were doing a rehearsal at the music school and one of the trumpet players who was in his same year, uh, Austin Ali is his name, he invited Thomas to just like sit in at the rehearsal basically just you know before he was oh. a member of the band so I met him I was you know we had a few things in common too you know it was around the point where I was auditioning for schools so I was like well I'm auditioning at UT I'm auditioning at these other places we had a few places in common that we had both decided on you know auditioning at um but you know he sort of just talked to me about UT for a little bit and I was like oh it seems like a like a cool and fun program. And then, you know, when I, when I eventually got here, you know, then I got to know him even better. And, you know, he has this thing called a Winglinski drive where you just drive for hours in a direction. It'll take you to like Brady, Texas for literally no reason. Right. <laughs> and you just, you just talk the whole time and, and listen to tunes. Um, so definitely, you know, going back to the actual question, I would say, you know, at this point now, I want to write tunes the same way that like guys like Stevie Wonder and Earth, Wind and Fire write tunes. But then I'm also looking towards like some of the really interesting like hard bop guys and sort of post bop as well. Um, recently, I've gotten like super into into like Miles Second Great Quintet stuff and like Wayne Shorter specifically there's some I don't know there's something about the like fluidity and and just the way that you can work with harmony over uh over like a fairly diatonic and you know simple melody yeah, um right that that some of those guys do that I'm just it just floors me every time um you know and then earlier on it was definitely you know taking lessons with with John Mills at UT, it was definitely a lot of like, you know, Michael Brecker and those, some of those like really hard, heavy, heavy hitting uh, saxophone players from, from like the seventies and stuff like that. You know, Steve Grossman, Dave Liebman, just all of those insanely like shreddy post coal train guys that just have gobs and gobs of, of the like original bebop language in them, but just applied in a completely different way, basically. Sure. And that stuff really, I really latched on to that a lot when I was uh when I was, you know, still still developing my my own sound and everything. So I would say that's definitely a big part of it. Um man, I want to ask too about uh the, the with you playing with big wise and everything, because I I just remember that that the first time I think we met was in an alleyway behind in West Campus uh, before a like co-op gig that if the fire marshal uh, even saw that room from the street, that place would have been completely cleared because there were more people in there than I had ever thought you could fit in a single room. Uh, like, I'm pretty sure they had the AC cranked down and it was still like a hundred degrees because <laughs> body heat was like, I was, I think I had just come from a gig and I was regrettably still in my suit and just drenched by the time I left. But, um, so you, I think you said that you were playing these, these brass band gigs while you were in high school. Yeah. So I started playing with big Wise whenever I was 
about like four months into my senior year of high school. I had also just started working a job at Amy's Ice Cream. So I don't really know how I like made it all work. Yeah. But what, what was that connection like? How did you start playing with a, a band that was playing college party gigs, but you're still in high school? Where was that? You know, who was that connection? Yeah. So when I was in a, when I would, did region jazz band in high school, I was in in one of the big bands with a few guys from Big Wise. They were all seniors at Westlake High School and I was still like a sophomore, I think. Um, but I met Wyatt, the band leader there. And then uh, two of the trombone players, Justin and Will were also in the band. And I guess they just remembered me literally because they were, you know, they got to a point where they were looking for another saxophone player. Um, they actually had a, a, you know, an international tour on the books for, uh, for going to Guatemala for the, the like international Guatemala jazz festival that happens every year, kind of around oh. spring break. Um, so basically I just got a, like a Facebook message or a text or something like that from either Wyatt or Will, I can't remember who, but they were just like, Hey dude, it's been a really long time. Uh, we played in like region jazz band together. You want to join our like brass band we have some <laughs> have some parties and then we're also like going to Guatemala it'll be all expenses paid and everything and I was just like uh yes that sounds <laughs> like fun um yeah so I remember like the first gigs first few gigs I played were just random house party stuff and you know it kind of kind of went up from there started we started doing uh you know bigger venues and everything but for a while it was you know, I was the the one random little high schooler playing playing at these like really wild college parties. There was yeah. there was one I did my senior year, which was space underwear themed. <laughs> okay. Yeah, very strange. Um, great. It was a <laughs> it was a fun time for sure. Uh, you know, it was it was definitely like one of the wilder parts of my life for sure. I definitely thinking back on it, I definitely feel like that was a like cut loose moment for me. Sure, for sure. Because sure, it was like, oh, I can do just anything now. Like, cool. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm also very fascinated by that you you stayed in Austin. Obviously, the University of Texas and the jazz department there is nothing to snuff at at all. Um, and I believe did your sister go to UT? Yeah, she did. She okay. um she studied classical violin with Sandy Yamamoto there. Gotcha. So was there any sort of like inkling of being like, I want to venture out, I want to get beyond where I've always known? Or was there this idea of thinking, okay, well, the music scene here is really robust and there's also great teachers, so I might as well stay where is familiar. Um, what did that kind of look like in your decision process of where to locate? Oh, 100%. At first, I wanted to get out of here. There was like, I had gone to a, I was fortunate enough to receive a scholarship to this, um, this Berkeley five week summer camp that happens every year, which is basically just like, you know, spend a month in the shoes of like a Berkeley College of Music student and you get sure. to play in all these ensembles and, you know, you live on campus and dorms and everything, meet a bunch of really cool people. I had done that the summer before I started at UT and you know, I mean, they do a really great job there of making you want to go to that school. Yeah. Um, so admittedly, after that, my, you know, my first semester at UT, I was still like, oh, I don't know if I want to stay here. Like, you know, nothing against the people here or anything. It was just like sure. that other experience was just so, so different than anything I had ever had. You know, I was living in a completely different state. I had never done that before, you know. Yeah. I was in Boston just hanging out with people, but my parents were in town, you know, it yeah. was, it was a very different experience for me. So I think something about that just made me really want to get out. But then once I sort of took a backseat to myself, basically to my own thoughts and, and sort of let the semester go by, I sort of realized like I'm starting to make some real connections with people here. Mm. You know, that and then also I started getting a lot more calls for gigs that were, you know, outside of the 
you know, normal co-op party brass band scene that I was in. Right. Um, and that, that was really interesting. That was like really intriguing to me. Uh, I didn't think I would be able to, you know, step out into my freshman year of college and basically already be doing music full time, but yeah. it sort of happened that way where I just, uh, I met the right people and they liked how I sounded and kind of go went on from there. So yeah, no, definitely at first though, it was, there was something that made me really just want to, want to leave Austin. Um, you know, another part of it was I hadn't really auditioned at too many other schools for undergrad, you know, I mean, I knew I would be able to get in-state tuition at UT and that was a, you know, definitely a blessing there. And, uh, you know, and I was also lucky, like fortunate enough to be, you know, ranked in my class to where I got automatic, uh, automatic admission to UT. So that was like, okay, well, at least I got UT in my back pocket if right. I really want to go here. But then I only auditioned at a couple other places. And at first I sort of just had this like nagging feeling where I was like, I could have shown my stuff elsewhere. And like, you know, I, it could have had more options than just like two places. And one of them was like way too expensive, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, as I've gone through UT and gone through the program and met people, I've definitely come to the realization that I don't think I would be nearly the player I am if I had moved somewhere else. You know, I, I've sure. met so many people that have really influenced the way that I play and the person who I am, you know? Yeah. I, I really, you know, it's hard for me to think of anybody else first to name other than Thomas, to be honest. I've played with that guy literally so much. Well, and Thomas, Thomas is a real champion of the people who he, he sees that are amazing musicians and, uh, maybe aren't getting like as many of the calls, but he's like, these people should absolutely be, be getting the calls. Like I remember whenever he and I started playing together, um, that was mostly just because me and his dad would play together a lot Oh yeah, in, in Houston. And then he would get in and he kind of was like, didn't want to like overstep any boundaries at the beginning of us playing together. But he kept saying like, Hey, you know, I don't want to tell you who to hire, but here's like a short list of people who I think are really killing. And at the top of that list was you oh. and uh, uh, Kersman and uh, Chris Loveland and like all these other guys that like in uh, uh, Aaron, right? Like yeah. these people who's like, hey, like these people are really kind of earning their place, you know, musically, you should consider, you know, giving them a call for things. And I mean, Thomas has never once steered me wrong. You know, he's a, he's a champion for those guys. Um, now for the idea of like staying in Austin and, and then, uh, also I guess going back, I remember being in Lake Jackson, which is South of Houston and thinking about the Austin scene and being like, man, I'd love to make it to Austin, but there's just no way I'll be able to break into the scene. It's just so like probably so professional, so massive. I'd never been to Austin. And I was like, surely, you know, one of the big metropolitan cities, that's where it's just going to be like, you know, a million different people fighting for the same gig. You growing up here and having your parents already part of the music scene, did you still see the jazz scene or really just like gigging scene in general as this kind of maybe semi-attainable, but mostly unattainable because it's like so intimidating goal or was there a little bit more of a comfortability thinking, oh no, like my parents do this. I already kind of maybe have a little understanding of, of the culture. And did that give you any more peace of mind thinking that you would be able to break in to the scene and get gigs? I definitely had a little bit of familiarity with it, um, which, you know, sort of gave me that peace of mind a little bit. Um, but also it was just a, for me, I felt like it was this, it was a very like gradual process, you know, it was a, it was like a slow build until I, until I really started playing with, with more people. Cause you know, even in, even in my like last couple of years of high school, I would still every once in a while, just get together with, with, uh, you know, friends of mine that I had met through like the region jazz band stuff, basically. Um, and just get some random little like gig at, at a play at like some random place on the east side or something like that. Uh, we played a lot at Kenny Dorm's backyard. Definitely not a random place. Uh, <laughs> right. An awesome place. Love yeah. to hear of McMillan. Um, we would play there a few times. Uh, just 
you know, like a quartet even, or like quartet or quintet sort of just trying to, trying to do weird things with standards or just like write our own music for a little bit. Um, so every once in a while, I would sort of have something like that or, uh, you know, even just busking on the street, like during South by, I remember maybe my junior year of high school, me and uh, the saxophone player named Blaine Sixon, who I went to, or who I was in high school with, and then a drummer, we just, just the three of us, we just stood on the corner of like, I don't know, like 15th and, Con not, not 15th and Congress, uh, I don't know, like 6th and Congress, just like stood on a corner or something like that, and just like played for hours, uh -huh. while there was like, tons of people walking around and everything sure. just you know put a case out make make some money uh yeah. so that that was sort of my introduction to the fact that i could start doing that stuff but i would say very much it still felt like this sort of goal that i had to reach you know for a while it was i was very much in the the scene of people who would just be doing, you know, mostly co-op gigs and stuff like that. And I, you know, I did enjoy those a lot, but there was definitely, you know, that sort of awe of like, oh, when am I going to get called to do like a big band gig at the elephant room or something like that? Right. Like that was always in, in, you know, in my mind, you know, I've been going to, I've been going to the elephant room since I was like 14 or 15, as we right. talked about a few weeks ago. Um, so, you know, seeing, seeing times 10, like every few months or whatever, I was always like, I want to get to the point where I don't have to defend myself to someone, to someone while I'm getting something, because I can just say, oh, no, I'm playing. Like, sure, I'm sure. cool. <laughs> for so sure. for, yeah, so for a while, and I mean, oh, for a while, I was, I was totally trying to, like, I totally had that as like a, you know, like a, a marker basically in my future. And I was like, I need to make sure I get to that point at some time. Yeah. And, you know, through, through guys like, you know, Matt Maldonado, you know, I mean, I sat next to Matt for, you know, all the parts of my, my undergraduate degree that counted at least. Right. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, that guy's, that guy's incredible. Um, And, you know, he was such a, such a kind, kind soul and like a great, you know, a great mentor to me, whether or not he thought of himself as that or not, I totally viewed him like that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he, he like, he's thrown me, thrown me gigs and stuff like that. And I, I feel like he's definitely part of, part of why I've, you know, sort of gotten to be working with some of the people that I'm working with now is just through through having these experiences with the guys who, who like know everyone, you know, yeah. cause then they put in your name and put in a good word for you. And then all of a sudden you get randomly called when some dude has to miss last minute or whatever. Right. Yeah. And man, I can't say enough amazing things about Matt, uh, Matt, because when I first got into town, I mean, when I was in San Marcos, I remember he was the very first person who reached out to me. I was, uh, at that point, I had auditioned for Vintage uh, and was so sure that I wouldn't get it. You know, like I just, I did so much homework and I went to these auditions and uh, I was, you know, sitting outside, you know, in a row of chairs and just like, not like trembling, you know, but like on the inside being like, oh shit, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I auditioned for the group and then I remember getting home that night or maybe it was the next day and I get this Facebook message from from Matt and he's like hey man heard you're you're in town you're like being a singer and going to be doing some stuff with vintage and uh he's like just wanted you to know that like if you ever need anything you know just let me know I would love to hear you and jam with you and I think at that point he was still either he had just left San Marcos or he was about to or something something along those lines but Matt has been another huge like you said whether he considers himself to be or not like a huge mentor but he's just so humble about it too. You yeah. Know, it's just more about like, if he sees potential in something, you know, he wants to foster that and not be someone who's just going to vibe 
And I think that also is telling because he really encouraged you and you guys are like the same instrument too, right? Whereas most people would see that as like a competition thing. He's more like, no, I'm just going to like build up these people around me because he's just a super swell human being. Yeah. I can't say enough good things. Oh, about dude. Yeah. What a, what a great guy. Yeah. Did you feel any kind of family pressure um, to, to do music or anything like that growing up? Uh, because obviously everyone in your family is musical, whether it is like a full-time occupation or it's, you know, something that they just do after work. Did you feel any sort of pressure to kind of follow in those footsteps or was it just a pretty natural progression of like, I've caught the bug or maybe it's genetic? I would say maybe there was some self-imposed pressure, honestly. Um, but I think most of that just came from, again, being around it so much, I almost felt like uh, it was it was definitely like uh, the the right path for me to go down, or at least the path the path of least resistance for sure. Um, <laughs> sure, definitely, definitely, absolutely no uh, no pressure from my parents though. They are, you know, two of the most kind and supporting people I've ever I've ever met, and they, uh, you know, they just wanted me to to do whatever I liked basically. And, you know, it worked out pretty well that I liked music a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm sure I, I mean, I'm sure I would have uh, probably caught some looks at least from other people, you know, being, if I had been the, you know, the one, the one kid in the, in the Santos Sharp family who didn't, <laughs> who didn't play, play music out of the four just cause, you know, my again my sister and my my dad and my mom and everything um especially because early on my sister really had a an interest in uh or for a while she she really had an interest in like learning some of the some of the like shoto and brazilian music that my parents were playing too and she wanted to like you know sit in with them sometimes at their yeah. gigs and that was really cool to me too but it was never I was always like a little, a little worried, I guess, about it just because putting, putting yourself out there with people, you know, no matter who they are, and even if they are your parents, you know, putting yourself out there with people who know so much more about the type of music that you're playing than you do. It's, you know, it can be, you're putting yourself in a pretty vulnerable situation personally, at least that's how I felt. Um, but overall, I'm, you know, I'm super thankful that I didn't feel pressure from anybody else because I think that's a thing that can that sometimes be really really handy and sometimes it can totally push you in a different direction and you know sometimes it's not the right path you know I think yeah. pressure it, it, pressure is such an interesting thing to talk about just in the in the perspective of a musician you yeah. know because I feel like if you go to music school and you're studying performance or something like that, even performance composition, studying anything music related, really. I feel like most people, at least I would assume, have the pressure of like, okay, well, now I have to do something with this degree. Sure, like, what sure. am I going to, I have to be a musician now. Like, that is the only path for me. I got, I spent all this money on this music degree. I can't just not do that now. Right, right. right. And I think that even just that self-imposed pressure, it's like, it's, it's tough. It can put you in a spot where you really look down upon yourself just because like, like, you know, you think it might be a personal thing when in fact, it's just because sometimes the world is just like not ready for arts to be considered professional and stuff like that. And that's, you know, that's a really upsetting thing. Um, I am just really thankful that I was able to you know get over that hump basically yeah. and and move move on to a point where I'm I'm really happy with with where I'm at and you know I'm happy with the music I'm getting to play and the people I'm playing with and stuff like that yeah man I I think that's a really amazing point that uh, people don't talk about enough you know especially being I remember at the end of my undergrad even though I was gigging almost full time to the point where I was like maybe maybe neglecting my my studies a little bit I mean certainly not to a point where it was like noticeable but in the sense of you know I see everybody else who's going at this opera degree that I'm getting 
very intently and they can tell you like all these different operas and, and such. And, and I had a little bit different of a mindset of why I was getting that degree uh, and why I was doing the classical route was just so I could unlock the fullness of, of, of how to correctly use my instrument in a way that could work in like a combo setting and could also work in a big band setting. Right. And I think that that, that, knowledge was you know invaluable i mean it was really really amazing but i had very different intentions about which route i was going down which was obviously jazz and everyone everyone kind of knew it while they were watching me around that but even at the end of the degree i was making what you know us musicians would consider to be like a livable wage while i was in school and i was very thankful for that but there was this pressure at the end, you know, looking back a couple of years now of like, okay, well, I got this music education degree and I, I don't want to like, I don't want to prolong the, the trope of like, oh, you get an education degree as like a backup plan. Um, but if I'm being honest with myself, it was a little bit of that. You know, I certainly didn't want to go pay a bunch of money for a piece of paper that said that I, you know, knew how to sing. I wanted to have something just in case the career path didn't didn't go as I thought it was as a performer. So there was that pressure of, okay, well, do I need to be an educator to be true to what I spent, you know, a lot of time doing in the past, like the last one year of the degree, certainly with the, the music ed uh, certification, but also is a life in music sustainable, you know, from a financial perspective. And yeah, everything is like, coming up roses now but when does you know quote unquote the music stop and when do I have to you know as some parents might say wake up and get a real job you know mm. something like that because uh, we do work in an industry where there there it is a disproportionate amount of people that don't make it as opposed to than do but I think that's a whole nother conversation of well how much how many of those people who quote unquote don't make it are forced out because they're told these lies of, and that, that pressure gets to them to the point where they cave. If we promoted this idea of, of being encouraging and showing that there are certain, while still being realistic, but that there are certainly paths to make music a viable profession uh, for people who are not on the, you know, million dollar Lady Gaga, you know, Katy Perry route, how much more art would we be filling the world with? So I guess my question to you is you were like, I'm really happy with where I'm at. What does there, I'm sure there are a lot of people watching where they are kind of going through the throes of that right now. How did you get through that pressure onto the other side to where, or at least, you know, on a daily basis, how do you get through that pressure to the other side where you're able to have like a very positive outlook and, and s sustain that, that self-confidence? Um, yeah, I think part of how I was, I, I mean, probably most of how it was, was just, you know, talking, I mean, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have this resource of my parents who have gone through similar stuff, basically, as as you know musicians themselves um but talk talking with other people honestly really helped um i don't remember exactly when but you know there was just a, a point basically it was like you know a winter or a summer or something like that like one of the one of the sort of off seasons for gigs where you know i just wasn't really getting called for like anything basically and i had you know one or two like pretty small things on the books, but that was about it. And I was just like, at that point I was like, wow, I really hope like people still will call me, like what's going on? You know, it was, you know, it was my first sort of like gig drought basically. Right. When I experienced and I, you know, just getting to sit down and talk with my parents about it and just sort of explain what I was feeling. And, you know, I'm so, again, I'm so fortunate that they, sat down and listened to me and you know had this conversation but they you know they opened opened my eyes up to you know the fact that you know you're gonna have these sort of up up and down periods but you always need to things will things will always hopefully you know i mean things will turn up some some way or another you might have to sort of make your own path um 
or sometimes it might fall into your lap. It's sort of, uh, I don't know, it's almost like a game of chance, but sure. Um, I don't know. I'm thinking about the sort of, uh, you know, making your own path. I, I feel like that sort of connects back to what we were just talking about too, with like, you know, getting out of a music degree and then just being like, okay, what next? You know, so yeah. many people aren't, so many people aren't told that there are way more jobs in the arts and creative fields than they realize, yeah. even if they just, even if they have a, you know, a diploma saying they can they can perform well you know you sure. can you can do stuff completely outside of the performance spectrum if you if you want to and they're like there are the, there are those positions out there as well it's it's unfortunate that in this day and age the those other opportunities aren't as aren't put forward as much as mm -hmm. as some other some other viable jobs are um you know for a different for a different career path, you know, I mean, if you're studying business or law or whatever, you know, you have a bunch of different ideas of, of what you can do. There's a, you know, a plethora of it, but if, you know, sometimes if you're studying music, it can feel like, all right, well, I either need to become an internationally renowned, like solo artist or whatever, or I do nothing. And it's like that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, sort of, I guess, I guess also for me getting over getting over that hump was um, was partially from me sort of realizing, well, like there's a lot of different things I can do to have a musical career with, even if I don't always play every single time I want to, you know? Sure. There's writing, there's, you know, there's writing, film scoring, there's, you know, leading groups there's teaching you know especially especially you know having having that education degree in your case i imagine you know even if you're not uh not actually you know going out and and teaching at a at a school or anything it still gave you a lot of insight and in just to like how to carry yourself as a person and per be professional and act and treat other people professionally as well like it's all such useful information that I feel like sometimes can get a little bit pushed off to the side just because you get this like tunnel vision of like all right I have to do this one thing now sure. oh my gosh as a band leader it's it's immeasurable right also as a singer you know people have the expectation that a singer is not going to be able to say you know all right so like here at, at this measure number instead of playing this, you know, and then detailing what they want them to play or whatever, if there's like a slight modification to the chart or, or just even, even in a combo, right? Not even like a big band, like in, in a combo and being able to articulate the intros that you want, the outros that you want, what you want the roadmap to look like if there's just like a, you know, on the fly type arrangement thing, being able to articulate that is utilizing the, the exact skills that you are learning as an educator, because as an educator, really what you're saying is, is you're learning how to be a leader for people so that way you can instruct how you want your vision to be created, right? That's all that like a lesson plan is. It's clearly articulating and setting out what it is you want to accomplish and how you want the people with you to accomplish that goal with you together. Mm -hmm. That's all, that's all teaching is. And, and that's why, you know, but, but I also don't want that to come off as if like, oh, I'm the band leader and now I'm like teaching all these people. No, it's very much a collaborative effort, but there does have to be somebody who is leading, right? Um, now, is that to say that I don't look over at James and go, how do you want to do this? Or David or Thomas and say, how do you guys want to do this? Because I also really love the idea that even though there is like a maybe like a point person as the band leader, there's also the ability for equal collaboration where somebody like <laughs> one, one of the things that I just forgot about this, but at the Ruth's Chris gig that me and James and Thomas would do uh, you know, before COVID, uh, Thomas would be like, oh my gosh, you guys want to do, you go to my head? And I was like, sure. And then he'd be like, okay, you got, or James, you do this over at this part. And I would like act like I had a top hat on and I would just go, 
and put it on Thomas be like, <laughs> he's wearing the band leader hat now, you know? And so like, that's very exciting, but man, what, what wisdom that you had to be able to like have that insight of being like eliminating that binary of I'm either going to be the most working performer or I'm going to be doing nothing. Like that is not something that I feel like people think about at all. Like I, or no, I feel like people do think about that and they don't think about like, oh, well, I could be doing this and this and this and this, uh, like all the alternative routes. And maybe it's just because these things aren't talked about as much, um, especially if we're going, you know, in our degree into one very specific field, but it's certainly something that I think would give a lot more people a lot more peace uh, if, if it was m part of the, the more prominent conversation. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, you know, I don't want to rag on any music, music departments or anything, sure, but, uh, sure. you know, all the classes I took were very much like either related to performance or history of some sort or, uh, or theory basically, but, you know, basically what I, what I feel like the stuff that kind of everybody seems to miss out on, except for really, except for like the people getting education degrees is like the, the professional side of it. Cause mm. I mean, as you were saying with the education degree, I mean, you know, even if you are primarily being taught how to teach other people at like a, at a very like student teacher level, you mm. know, student teacher relationship, you know, middle school, high school, elementary school, whatever, those skills are so important yeah. uh, regardless, you know, as you were just saying, being a band leader, running a rehearsal effectively, that's something that I definitely know some people don't know how to do. And sure. it can be, it can be frustrating being in a rehearsal where we just keep on doing the same thing over and over again, because, because the person running it can't articulate what they want. And, you know, having, having those, those skills you know, on the business side, on the professional side, and on on the playing side and everything, I think is so important. And I definitely think it needs to be more more towards the front of of really anyone getting a degree in music at this point, really a degree in anything at all. You know, you should learn how to how to professionally interact with people and and you know manage yourself as a business because that's that's what you are right now you're you're your own business you gotta you gotta make ends meet you gotta you know come out on top basically otherwise you know you have to start thinking about what else you're gonna do yeah and that's a scary doc, thought yeah uh doc watkins and i were talking about this about like He's like, yeah, like music school. And again, not to rag on anybody's uh, curriculum, but like, he's like, music school is great and teaches you a lot of really great things, but who's going to teach you, you know, uh, uh, how to get a gig. And then not only how to get a gig, but how to keep a gig. Like, that's the thing, man. Like, and that was something that, you know, like we all have to, because it's the nature of how it is. We had to learn like in the school of hard knocks, just like on the scene, but there were, there were many either steakhouse gigs or bistro gigs or hotel gigs things where I kind of you know luckily I was never I've never been fired from a gig but there were certainly times where I was like oh it's I'm seeing the engagement from the audience be less how do I now need to diversify and structure my set that pleases the audience, which will in turn please the manager, <laughs> which will in turn keep the money coming in, you know, because you want to keep the gig above all else. And then not only that, but then like how, how to present yourself to band leaders who are going to be hiring stuff, you know, um, and, and how to market yourself in a way of being like, yeah, I can, I, I'm, I'm a good hang. And also I can, you know, play my stuff and, and I can help out in a pinch, you know, uh, those are the things that we need to be teaching more. Uh, uh, it's just like what, what the gigging, like if there was an entire course or a two semester course dedicated to like, like professionalism in the gigging workplace, you know, both as be so a nice. booker or as a sideman or as a band leader, like all these different things. Oh my God. How, how, how many, how many, <laughs> 
you know, kind of gigs from hell would we would we avoid just by like learning those prerequisite skills? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. It's it's incredible, honestly. Uh, you know, thinking thinking about that stuff when just all the situations that could be avoided, right? If if everybody learned learned how to how to be a professional. <laughs> Um, so before we talk about the final question, which is about nightmarish gigs, I do want to ask, uh, if, if there's like a record or two that is like one of your favorites, uh, to listen to, what would you go and suggest? Like, as soon as this ends, everybody should go check out this record right now. That is a good question. Um, I mean, one of my all time favorite albums is I am by earth, wind and fire, you know, Thomas introduced me to that. So uh he can definitely get the credit for that um i would also say inner visions by stevie wonder yep. that's an album i have i have the the lp of that and i put that on you know any chance i get basically um you know in terms of jazz stuff i i always find myself going back to esp as well yep. the second great content album so good um i don't know i love i love getting into something and then not, and then like not listening to it for a while and then randomly coming back to it and just being like, oh, I miss yeah. this so much. <laughs> yeah. It's like the best feeling. I completely understand. It's, like, it's yeah. like seeing a friend that you haven't seen in, in a while. Like it's, yeah. I don't know, it's, it's exactly what I need right now to happen with people in person. But yeah. unfortunately it can't happen. <laughs> Right. I, I feel like I love doing that whenever I do it unintentionally, I, I, but I feel like more often than not, I will just listen to a record until I hate it and then yeah. put it on the shelf. And then five years later I go, oh, well, like, let's, let's put this back on. Like I had the mistake uh, earlier, like in late high school, early college, where I would hear a song that I really, really thought was killing. And then I would make it my alarm uh, in the mm. morning and I'd be like, Oh, cause then I'd start my day with like the thing that I really thought was amazing. And then I associated it with making me stop sleeping. And then I was like, now I hate these songs. I can't think about that shit anymore. <laughs> yeah. Right, 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 right. There, there is one big band chart of you make me feel so young that I, every time I hear it now, I'm just like, oh, wait, am I dreaming? Nope. Mm -hmm. God, I and it doesn't help that it was just like a screaming, you know, shout chorus to wake me up in the morning. So lesson learned um <laughs> and then the final question of course that we always ask is we all have gigs from hell where things were just crazy went up the wall between either corporate gigs or wedding gigs or brass band you know uh, uh college party gigs do you have any that stick out as just like oh i couldn't have gotten it out of there fast enough or just like a comical story of something that went wrong well I guess it's not like a like a gig gig. Well, I mean, it's totally a gig. Um, it wasn't like a a live gig though. This was a recording session I did for some for some dude. I I'm gonna be really honest. I can't even remember his name. Okay, um, that's how much I've like repressed this memory. <laughs> um, yeah, recording session I did maybe three or four years ago. Um, you know, it was for a friend of a friend, so I I was half doing it as a favor but half also like okay well you know this guy did say he would he would compensate us so i'm definitely gonna you know take that advantage basically um anyways basically this guy just was a very amateur level musician you know no i don't want to say anything about amateur sure. musicians you know that's awesome that you're picking that up but the thing he the things he was trying to do, he just really could not articulate them and could not make up his mind. And the horns that he was hiring, you know, we kept on trying to give him give him ideas and stuff, but it just turned into this like entire day basically sitting in this guy's garage and then another day sitting in in like a house studio. Yeah. Recording just different things that we just made up basically over and over again until he found something that he liked 
Oh no. And that was that was a pain. That was a real pain. Um <laughs> yeah, I remember he tried to give us uh I don't know how much you've used GarageBand, but like it has that, I think it has like a function where you can like take what you've recorded and then it'll create like a like a kind of bad like like chart of it basically with like actual notes and everything he tried giving us that at first and that was just absolutely a mess it was you know the rhythms and and timing and everything and notes were just all sorts of messed up um so then so then we were just like okay we'll just make up some stuff and i hope that you like it it's going to be similar vibe to what you like or to like the stuff that you had in mind and yeah it was just a a solid day basically of this guy just being like yeah that's cool can we uh can we do something like a little different just be like okay like what do you want different about it and just like something different it's like okay dude like goes I'm back to, I'm here. <laughs> goes back to what we were talking about is like collaboration is great but at the end of the day you also need a clear vision you know yeah uh wish that guy had had a clear vision i don't even know if i've ever heard the final product of this even um which i don't know if that says something about how much i hated the session or just how it went overall because like i don't even know if the other guys who were playing with me even have like heard the final product either it's just like this mystery guy basically that just kind of showed up out of nowhere i think he was like he was going to move somewhere in like South America to like be a doctor or something too. And it was like his final project being in Austin. I was like, okay, whatever. Sure. Very cool. Well, I <laughs> uh, we're going to release this. And then two days later, he'll be like, Hey, here's my single dropping. It's called right. visions. And it's like, all right, great. What a fantastic little single. Was it a whole record or was it a single? Uh, I think we played on like two tracks of this guy's EP or something like that. Okay. Two or three. It wasn't, it wasn't very much, but this guy just didn't know what he wanted. So it was just constantly con like, basically just, it would have taken less time for us to record a full range chromatic scale each person and just have him pick out like what he wanted oh. and just make it like that. Like <laughs> I really wish he had just done that. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, I now need to hear this. I, it, is, <laughs> it is now my life's mission to hear this track. No, 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 no. What happened? And we'll play out. Here we go into the yeah, track. Right. No, right. <laughs> it's like it becomes like a Jerry Springer thing where I'm like, well, little did you know, Paolo, we actually have him right here. Come on into the chat, you know, and start talking to him. Anyways, well, Palant, man, what, what a pleasure to sit and talk to you for a bit, man. Thank you so much for coming on. Dude, yeah, this was great. Thank you so much for having me. These are, it was a blast. And, you know, I love how you're putting these out, talking to, you know, people within the scene and then also people from like all over. Like I saw you had one with like Stephen Fife Key and that guy's, that guy's ridiculous. That guy's so awesome. Benny Benack, you have yeah. one too. Like you're getting, you're getting everyone in there. It's so cool. Thank you.